Welcome to the Freedom School, an opportunity to learn about history-bending campaigns and initiatives from across the globe. We are inspired by what the Freedom Schools meant during the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, a place for alternative learning for African Americans, a safe space to discover suppressed stories of courage under oppression, the wisdom of culture, and the determination of many to make the impossible seem inevitable. This Freedom School is part of Spadework, a program that seeks to nurture and develop a new generation of organizers committed to those same principles. Learning about the historical context of these important campaigns and movement initiatives allows us to reflect more deeply about our own current challenges. Inquiring and learning is part of the organizer's space work. Organizers are inspired by the people we meet and the stories we share with each other. We also know that this journey never ends, and along the way we find joy and satisfaction in practicing the proven organizing adage. Listen with an open heart to the lessons others have learned and apply what you think makes sense. Then reflect, rinse, repeat. If you are inspired by what you hear, or if you want to support the development of a new generation of organizers through spade work, then consider making a small contribution to keep this going. Go to www.spadework.school backslash donate right now, or simply click on the link on the chat screen. Enjoy your time together. Adelante. Morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the ninth of our 10th Freedom School sessions. My name is Larry Solomon. I teach in the Department of Race and Resistance Studies at San Francisco State University. Been there for a long time. Um, also a long time trainer in community organizing. Really excited to be part of today's unique uh, conversation. I'll explain what we're doing. Just give me a few minutes and I'm going to get through all the sort of details of today's program and, and introduce and set up our uh, our panel presentation, our roundtable presentation. It's not so round because we're on Zoom, so everything's square, but we'll call it a roundtable. Um, our loyal viewers probably can already tell something ain't right, and that's because my usual co-host, Alex Muhammad, is not here. Um, Alex is on a top secret assignment, an undisclosed location, can't get into all of that stuff. Don't worry, Alex will be back next week uh, for week 10, our last session of Freedom School. Um, connected to Freedom School, of course, is Spade Work. You've been hearing about this for the last two months. Spade Work is a new national organizer training program to nurture the next generation of organizers of color. Some of our participants today are part of that first cohort. Um, we're going to be really uh, lucky to hear from everyone today. So um, just real quick, a little bit more about Freedom School as you've been watching for the last couple of months as well. We have spent um, eight sessions hearing about really cool stories from past organizing campaigns, from friends of ours, from friends of friends of ours who have been uh, direct participants in these struggles, these campaigns, some as historic as the Great Boycott or next week, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's Freedom Summer and some much more recent. And we'll actually get a glimpse of some of those past uh, speakers, um, past guests in today's, uh, today's session because we'll show some video clips to the, the, that are panel will kind of reflect on today. Um, I want to like just remind folks that we're doing something a little different today. Um, we are going to attempt to model kind of an organizer's process, the re process of reflection. You heard there in the introduction, uh, Francis Calpatur, who will be joining us today, talk about this process of reflection and then rinsing and repeating this kind of thing that organizers do all the time. If they're, if they're smart, they're wise about like making sure that their practices aren't just sitting there and, and, and getting replicated without any sort of thought or without any sort of uh, reflection. So today we're going to kind of model some of this reflection by having a really great group of folks talk. Um, that is after all part of what organizers do, part of the spade work um, that organizers do. Organizers, you know, wear many hats. Uh, they're responsible for doing outreach and 
development of new members and leadership development of staff and new organizers. Uh, organizers plan constantly. They're talking about demands and issue development and targets and how to dramatize the, those demands with protest action, direct action. They try to raise money. They do so many things. They wear so many hats. Um, and when they do these things, like I said, they spend, if they're wise, they spend some time reflecting on, on what it all means, on how effective it's been, how things may need to change next time. Um, so, you know, here at Freedom School, we've, we've listened to our friends, especially in the chat conversation over the last two months, um, the questions that have come to us and, you know, the process of uh, our usual sort of sessions is that we try to address as many of those questions as we can get to. We don't always have time. And sometimes at the end, we're a little frustrated because we wish we could have spent more time getting into some particular themes. And really like a lot of those questions boil down to several themes. So I'm gonna announce those themes in just a second. But we thought it would be instructive today to uh, give space for participants um, to reflect on those themes and, and just really allow a good conversation between new organizers, relatively new organizers and veteran organizers um, just to kind of chew on a lot of these things. So um, a couple of quick programming notes before I introduce our guests today and, and talk about those themes. Just as always, we're live streaming on YouTube. Um, YouTube is also always the place where past episodes can be found. Um, this today is a conversation, like I said, among our roundtable guests, but that does not mean that we don't welcome your participation. Um, our audience is always great with the chat, so use that chat function, offer thoughts, questions. We'll kind of be separating these themes, so if you really are like, we got a burning question, you want to get it into that theme, throw it out there. I'll do my best to make sure it gets uh, the light of day. Um, also, as um, Naira said at the very, very beginning, just make sure that you, uh, because some of the videos that we're gonna show, the short clips um, will be in Spanish or English. So make sure your uh, interpretation button is selected uh, for the choice of your language. Um, and then finally, at the end today, we're gonna close by previewing our last session, which is, uh, which is gonna be really exciting, but we'll get to that later. I'd like to introduce today's guests first, who are part of what promises to be really interesting conversation, set of reflections, um, and, I, and I will uh, ask each of them to kind of introduce themselves a little bit more fully, but just so we know who's here today, we have Francis Calpatura with In Advance and Spadework, actually founder of Spadework. Um, Gina Asabo, my old friend, is a mentor in Spadework, among a million other titles that she's had over the years. Uh, we have Denise Rubin from Women on the Rise in Atlanta, Georgia. We've asked Denise to be here today because the Atlanta Hawks beat Philadelphia 76ers last night. That's not why, but no, we've got some important uh, geographical sort of uh, uh, spreading out today, um, but a few folks in Georgia. So in, in addition to Denise, we've got Jazz Espinosa with uh, Georgia Familias Unidas in Gainesville, Georgia, and then Gamila Abdel Halim with Emerald New Deal and also with In Advance. Um, we're going to ask each of those folks to kind of 20, 30 seconds, uh, fill out that introduction a little bit more so we know who's with us. Um, we've picked four themes. So back to those themes, the themes that we're sort of going to broadly feature today, we talked about it at the end of last episode, but these are kind of the things that have come up over and over, um, over the last eight sessions. And so theme number one, which we'll dive into first, is about how to do organizing when maybe your base or or the kind of broad society is is in the grip of a conservative populist moment. Um, another theme is the tension between doing mutual aid work or you know kind of popularly known as service work and organizing. So mutual aid work is especially prevalent in this last year with the pandemic and organizing. How do you marry those two tensions? Um, theme number three is about centering the directly impacted folks in, in an organizing model. And then of course, the one, the one constant every week has been about, you know, it started kind of with the question of burnout and organizers. Um, organizers like to talk about it with respect to self-care and organizing. So we're gonna get into that theme that will wrap us up. Each, of, like I said, each of the themes will be introduced by video clips from prior sessions. And then we'll ask one panelist at a time to kind of just start with their reflections and then we'll open it up to the rest of the panel. So those folks 
who um, you know are going to wait their turn. Just feel free to kind of just get involved in this conversation, um, and then again, the chat will will function as a as a way to kind of round out the larger kind of reflection. Um, finally, we're going to do something today we haven't done in previous uh, sessions, previous webinars, and we're going to allow everyone to see each other. Um, so. This was a feature for those of us who teach, you know, we've been on Zoom all year. We saw the, the squares and, you know, it was a, a sense of some kind of community that we have. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit more featured today than normal. Um, I'm, I think I'm gonna um, ask uh, our folks to make everyone a co-presenter um, if we could. So we're gonna make sure everyone pops up on your screen. Um, I think we're gonna do that. But first we're gonna introduce this first theme so I'm gonna ask Matt to kind of just start up that first video where we're getting into, again, the theme of organizing in a conservative populist moment. You'll hear a couple of short clips and then uh, Francis Calpatura will come on and offer some thoughts and reflections. So if we can get to that video, that would be fantastic. And just a reflection on this idea, on this national matter, that is that in Puerto Rico, we saw very intensely, you know, uh, uh, years, uh, intense years of uh, natural disasters. And we talked about this. We think, we believe that the crisis we're living in is a permanent crisis, that the state in itself, capitalism and the world as we know it is falling apart as we know it, and that it, through these cracks we have to emerge and create alternatives, and they have to be tangible, that they address the needs of the people, that people can have enough to eat, that they are physically and mentally healthy, that we can truly find ways for people to live a life with dignity, because this is a matter of survival. And this is something that we can uh, play out and apply right now, is imagining what is a healthy uh, future with dignity. And so we have to prepare ourselves, not just here in Puerto Rico, but what's to come, you know, to face this very intense and drastic capitalism that what it's done is, is deprived us and, and really impose this neoliberalism in a way we haven't seen before. And so, you know, we have to see mutual aid as a international strategy to, to hold up the people from the bottom. I, uh, I resonate with um, a lot that you all shared. It makes me think of uh, more recently, a lot of the organizations that we work with and support at the Mass Liberation Project uh, primarily focus on work around incarceration. And when we went into shutdowns with the pandemic, um, our, our folks who are already in a lot of need and in crisis, um, obviously like all of that was super heightened. Um, we had folks who were dying in the jails, not getting access to resources. Um, folks who didn't need to be incarcerated that needed to be released immediately. And so a lot of the groups that we support um, shifted into mutual aid work for the first time and are now in the process of figuring out um, how to continue to build that out and how to keep that as an important part of the work that they're doing. Um, and obviously that comes with a lot of challenges. And so uh, like Larry said, we do have a lot of questions in the chat and it's also a question that I have um, that I've experienced as difficult in organizing, which is why I appreciate you all saying, you know, this isn't about charity, it's about solidarity, it's about, right, the organizing. Um, but what, what have been some of the, the challenges and also how have you navigated shifting people from um, either receiving services or volunteering uh, into being kind of a, a deeper fold or member um, with the organization because, and then some of the questions too, just so that I don't miss um, uh, folks language. Like for example, we have a question that says, what does the politiz politicization and empowerment process look like for communities with limited political education and or how do you help communities realize that they're not doing you a favor? And I would assume also like, or just receiving a favor, but instead, uh, they're taking an opportunity to create change collectively. Mm 
Gracias por esa pregunta. Está muy buena. Thank you for that question. It's a very good one. Uh, well, right. In, be, that is why that transformation into organization, right? From ideological to material and to basic needs, right? That is why we came into that reality that we also live, right? It, in, in that way, not be disconnected uh, to the people and the work that we do, because as we are doing this collective, right? The, the, uh, uh, we, 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 you know, we get uh, understand things, right? I think that the politi politicization is given uh, happens daily in those one-on-one -on -one relationships. As we were mounting uh, solidarity purchases, we had of conversations. People uh, let uh, their feelings out, right? Uh, by working collectively, we w created a space to be able to speak about other needs that are not only material, right? And I would say that people, arrive as volunteers because they you know like saw this really beautiful project but once those relationships are developed with the people that we're working alongside uh, with um in our case we had uh the event that everyone saw right and at the end uh people would after the hurricane would say like where should i go support that was um, obviously a clip about mutual aid. And I, I mentioned that the first theme will be about uh, sort of a different piece, but I'm, I, I'm gonna, we're just gonna jump right into this idea of marrying mutual aid work and organizing work and the tension between maybe doing one too much. Um, Gina Sabo, old friend of mine is going, I keep saying old friend, I don't mean old, you know what, what I mean. You all know what I mean. Gina Sabo is, um, is going to give some thoughts and reflections on what you just heard and also broadly speaking around the around the theme. Gina, can you introduce yourself just a little bit more and then we'll we'll get into this. Sure. Good morning everybody. It's great to be with you. I'm Gina Acebo. Um, I started organizing when I was in college and um, came to a place called the Center for Third World Organizing. I've been a labor organizer and community organizer. Um, I've worked as a racial justice trainer and most recently um, to out myself, I have been a philanthropist and have worked in racial justice funding uh, at a foundation. I'm so really glad to be here with all of you. Great, great. And so some thoughts of your Gina on, on the theme of mutual aid and organizing. And if you can maybe yeah. talk some personal experience too and the work of this, the past year and, and how relevant that's all been. Yeah. Um, so when I first started in organizing, um, you know, and I think it's for a lot of us, I think we're working with the communities uh, that we, I was fortunate to work in communities that I grew up with, or were very similar to the communities I grew up with, which are prim pr primarily uh, communities of color, black folks, uh, Filipino folks, Latino folks, and um, we knew that there were issues that were important to people, housing, education, healthcare, um, and amidst all those issues that people were facing, there were other issues that were facing that were just about surviving, right? Um, and so when I started as a young organizer, I had a real kind of um, tension about what it was to be able to work on a campaign, to focus on a target, to ask for a set of demands um, that might actually take, you know, months or even years to actually reach um, the things that people needed. Um, and there was a stress really of thinking about how can we address people's real material needs at this moment. Um, and I think I always struggled with it as a young organizer because I was trying to figure out what the balance was between what it meant to look, what it looks like to build power with people and what it means for people to actually live as whole folks, to, for us as organizers to see whole people, not just them as a student or as a renter, but as a parent, as a mother, as a daughter, um, you know, as an artist. And so uh, I think really last year when the pandemic hit, it really gave me an opportunity with all my years uh, working in the field as an organizer, really thinking about how important mutual aid can be in building organizations and building power. Um, because what we're really looking at is for people's ability to really dig deep into the issues they care about and to be able to live fully. Um, and I think that in the pandemic, we saw a real turn for organizations um, switching or pivoting from really, you know, building campaigns, thinking about who their targets were and thinking about who their people were, thinking mm -hmm. about what they needed in terms of food, what they needed, oh, slow down. 
No, yeah, Gina, I'm just going to ask you if, you if you don't mind for the interpretation, just to slow down just a little bit. Sure. Um, but yeah, you're great. Go ahead. Um, what they needed in terms of, you know, getting their basic needs, getting health care, being able to see their families and their loved ones being separated for them. So we saw a lot of organizations pivoting to doing that work. And when I say pivoting to it, meaning that it's not like they weren't doing that work, but it gave them in some weird and interesting way, a chance to really pause and think about who their base was and what it was they needed to thrive and what they needed to take care and what it was to build organizations that actually focused on being able to think about campaigns, but thinking about community and what their relationships were. So I think now when we think about um, the work that we're trying to do, we're really trying to think about what it means to build trust and relationships that are based on people's real lives, but also really acknowledge um, that we have an opportunity to use these moments of mutual aid, as many speakers have spoke about in Puerto Rico, as Alfredo spoke about, that those are building blocks for being able to build the relationships and the leadership that's necessary to do the campaign work. Um, and that we actually have to build relationships with other allies whose main work may not be organizing work, they may be some level of service, they may be some level of care, where we actually can rely on them that have shared values with us to help do that work with us. Um, and so this is an opportunity to not just build the way we think about as organizers, but the kind of organizations we're trying to build. Um, thank you, Gina. And again, I want to remind you and everyone else if we can just keep things a little slower, um, talk a little slower pace so, so everyone can kind of follow. Um, but that's really interesting about, you know, thinking about organizing, uh, doing service work as building blocks and People often say it's service and the service of organizing. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, Matt to switch all our folks as panelists so we can make sure everyone can kind of jump in and, and participate because I'm gonna ask for other reflections from our, from our great round table today. And I, it's really nice to see other folks in the, in, in, the, in the room, so to speak, in the chat um, and in sort of face-to-face. -face. But if we can do that, it might take just a second as we're doing that. Um, but yeah, so, so thanks Gina for those. Um, important reflections. I wonder if we have anyone else from our roundtable willing to, to dive in and, and pick up what, what Gina dropped there. Um, chew on a little bit what Gina talked about. Yeah, I, this is Francis. Um, so I, I suggest, I, before I comment, I suggest as folks um, mess with their view things to gallery so you could see people's faces. Oh yeah, look at all those peoples. And I also would greatly kind of suggest to folks that um, that folks turn on their cameras. There you go. So that we can see your beautiful faces. Um, Francis Calpatura, I am the founder and director of In Advance, which is the, the sponsoring organization for spade work. Um, and so just a just a quick thing on this, right. <clears throat> and, and and kind of slightly, I want to make it slightly controversial because organizing is always about being close to people, right? Organizing is about kind of being close to and, and embracing people in their totality. If you're a good organizer, that's what you do, right? And, and so therefore, kind of when folks are in need, of course, you're going to go in, right? And, and address kind of the immediate needs that folks have because especially if folks are hurting. Right. But here's kind of the thing that, I'm, that I've seen though lately, and I've seen this in prior instances as well, when there's a big need, when there's kind of a thing. Right? The question always is, how do we actually turn that so that there's long-term, longer-term structural changes so that those things don't happen again? to folks, right? Do we create or turn the, the immediate need stuff that we try to do with our members and our base? Do we turn that to demands of the state? Do we, dem do we turn that into demand so that in fact, that, the, that institutions that are supposed to feed our people, that are supposed to house our folks, that are supposed to kind of do all of those things, do we turn those instances and opportunities into demands of, of the state and of the institutions. And that's the thing that I don't see as much of in, 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 in this, this pivot is do we pivot, we need to pivot all the time, but do we pivot in a sense that builds kind of the power and the demands of the institutions that's supposed to serve people? 
Good. And I think we're going to hear this theme again, right? Everything about building the organizer's creed is about constantly building and building a larger uh, mass, building a larger base, um, but doing it strategically with something in mind. And, and, and what Francis and Gina have both talked about there is with a, with a, with a goal in mind around making demands on, on systems, um, not just providing services. And every time I say that, I, I realize how dismissive it sounds when it's like, oh, we're not just providing services, we've got to do the organizing piece too. And it's not to give shade to, to service work because service work is you know, the essential work. But again, this is a, a bigger question for organizers. There's tons of organizations that do service work, not so many that do organizing work. So I wonder if anyone else in our roundtable wants to chime in on this, uh, on this theme that we're jumping into so far. And, and by the way, I like the uh, admonition from Francis to turn your cameras on. I was yelling at my students for the last year and a half to do that. And I got kind of tired of doing that, but we got beautiful faces here, obviously. So like, let's show them off, come on now. Um, all right, what other, what other reflections we have? We've got uh, Jazz, we've got Denise, we've got Camila. Denise, go ahead. I'm sorry, Camila, go ahead. Okay, I have a reflection on on this from like my perspective of um, organizing internationally or back home, you know, uh, because <clears throat> it's very hard to do organizing like in certain um, settings without offering the mutual aid because um, there are immediate needs that need to be met. And if you don't meet them, chances are like the powers of evil have the power, have the means, have the money to give that, uh, to satisfy that need. And then eventually take that people uh, away from you or from your organizing, you know, cause and shift their, you know, um, focus from like resolving the issue or um, the problem that is at hand to like, you know, just like, to the other side. And this this is especially in like communities like I'm from Sudan. So over there there is like a lot of factors that play into you know the political conscious or the the um, uh, activism or um, organizing work that that people do there. You know the re religious factors there is like sectorial uh, royal uh, loyalties there is different things. So a lot of times like people, you know, give the aid or the, <laughs> with one hand and give like, you know, something else with the other hand, you know what I mean? <laughs> it started with like maybe the missionaries, you know, like, you know, the, you know, Christians going to Africa and kind of like, you know, giving aid and at the same time, Christianing all the communities, you know, and then just creating all this divide and problems that are still we're suffering from. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is this is my my and also like you know now like religious extremism, you know when when especially young people they're like frustrated, they don't have opportunities, they don't have, you know, they they could be, be like easy prey for like you know extremism for like you know all these kind of things. So, I mean, that's just like my reflection from my background of organizing and working in 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 Sudan. It's such an important point. Somebody's going to do the work, right? I mean, you, you might as well figure out ways to do it where you're reaching the, that 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 affected base, that affected population. So that's a, a really important point. Um, well, let's get um, uh, Jazz and and Denise in on this. But um, you know, it's often organizers, like in, especially in the United States, who go through organizer training, often learn from methods pioneered by Saul Alinsky. And Alinsky famously said, to hell with charity, you're only strong enough to get what your base is gonna be able to get you. You're only gonna get what you're strong enough to get. It's about power. It's not about services. It's not about charity. The church and other organizations can do that. Camila's point is that that's sometimes fraught with risk, but um, Jazz and Denise, you have thoughts on this? And we can kind of keep coming back to Fran and Gina if you all have some, some other ideas. You gotta unmute yourself if uh, you can remember to do that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for bringing up that point, Camilla. That's uh, something great. Greetings, that... everyone. Um, 
I'm here based in Atlanta and uh, I, I'm working with uh, another, another organization, BAM, um, and we do bailouts. Um, so with them fam, we had a young lady that was, a, uh, um, I don't know, in between moves, uh, but she was supposed to be uh, one of our case, case man, uh, a case manager. And, and so uh, I think it was, it was kind of hard for her to do her job because of her situation. And um, so we had to, uh, we had a lot of, um, what, what should I say, uh, coordination meetings. And um, we were trying to um, try to get her the mutual aid that she needed. So in order for, uh, for, for, for us to be able to do the work that we need to do, at, at times, um, you know, there has to be that mutual aid there to give to people because people can't do the work without the services. Uh, you know, people can't get fed without food. So yeah, we, we have to make sure that people are uh, okay in order for them to do the work that they need to do. This young lady, she ended up moving to, I think it was Mexico because uh, um, her, her living situation. And, um, but I think once she got there, we were able to get her, you know, some of the funds that she needed. Um, but yeah, in order to do the work, um, we have to make sure that people are okay. Yeah. Yeah, such a such a powerful point. I mean, it seems right there. Right, that's uh, the the reason. Um, Jazz, you wanted you were saying earlier. I want to jump back to Jazz Espinosa, one of our participants, um, and then we'll maybe bring it back to Gina. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Gotcha. Perfect. So yeah, I just wanted to thank y'all for bringing up those points because that's actually something that I have been thinking about a lot lately, and. Uh, honestly, with the, the main concept that was informing our work out here in Gainesville, when our first goal was to meet the need, the immediate needs of the poultry workers who had lost their primary source of income. And often these folks were the sole income for the household. So when, yes, we were faced with an issue of how do we strategize? How do we start to come up with demands? Uh, what are our tactics that we are going to um, be pursuing? But you have folks who aren't able to support their, their households. So where do you start? And the first immediate point for us to try to acknowledge was that these folks have immediate needs. They're not going to be able to um, even think about strategizing elsewhere if their main concern right now is to meet their immediate needs of survival. So when we talk about mutual aid, um, there was this great definition that I heard about where it was Mutual aid is about increasing the capacity to organize with your fellow comrades. So it's not just about charity. It's about increasing their capacity to then be able to have the space, have the ability and have the stability to be able to move forward. Um, yes, I'm gonna troubleshoot the language here. Okay. Can folks hear me on the English channel now? Yes, yeah. absolutely. All right, apologies for that. No, I'm good. Um, yeah, so I guess to um, summarize what I just said, basically um, we can't mobilize if folks don't have capacity to mobilize. And the way they can mobilize is by at minimum meeting their survival needs, addressing the um, the lack of capacity that they have to strategize and mobilize if they are solely focused on how do I feed my family? Mm -hmm. So we got to inform our strategies and our tactics with that understanding at the core at all times. And that's something that's informed our work out here in Georgia, um, out here in North Georgia specifically, where um, 
jobs are hard to come by if you're undocumented. So folks can't afford to be blacklisted from certain industries or else they lose the sole avenue of income. So how do we navigate and negotiate those um, realities? Okay, thanks so much, Jess. This is what we're gonna do today, right? We're gonna not have simple, you know, sound bites. It's just com complicated work. Um, Gina, I wonder if, uh, not to put you too much on the spot here, but you've heard some of the reflections now from your, your opening. If you have any, uh, any kind of wrap up thoughts before we move on to the next theme. No, I mean, I think folks really touched upon that, you know, I, I mean, not to make, be overly simplified about this, but like organizing is actually about people. Um, and it is about power, but it's about the relationships that we're forging. And this idea about building power has to involve sacred care. And I think, you know, how we examine that, how we build that into our organizations is essential. Um, but I think it's not the end point. I think I, what everyone is saying here, mutual aid and the way that we see this again as a building component for building the leadership of folks in our community who, who clearly can see that there are problems. You know, our jobs as organizers is to be able to be able to kind of, again, return back like that these conditions are not what they're supposed to be. So even though we might build spaces and places for mutual aid, we're really building something towards a, a bigger and better North Star that these communities actually can articulate and think about and build towards. And you can't do that just through aid. You have to do that through organizing. And so when we can think about holding both of those spaces in our organizations, as opposed to trying to silo them off, um, we might have a, a better way to actually make our way towards those goals that make our communities whole and liberated. Right. That's really, really well said. Uh, you're going to find that some of these themes have overlap. All of the themes have overlap. I mean, that's what organizers think about all the time is how to kind of marry a lot of these ideas at the same time. I want to move a little bit to this next theme, and, and it's where we wanted to start um, around this question of how to do organizing in a conservative populist moment. Um, I think we have a couple of short clips, and then I'm going to ask Francis to uh, to opine. Puerto Rico, in, in general, ha sido eh, un, un contexto Rico, difícil. For the most part, eh, um, has been situated in a difficult a context um, um, uh, as we try to analyze este, coloni uh, un, un, colonization un, un through a political, de, economic de, lens. And it's been an important de challenge de um, in figuring out how Puerto Ricans can ground themselves in hope so that things can be better. Right. And there was actually another short clip that went along with that one. The context for that was doing mutual aid work in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico two, three years ago, four years ago now. Um, but also to sort of generally speaking, doing political work in that kind of, with that, with that need in mind. We as organizers, like we don't carry the burden of like having, having to have all the answers. Like that's all of our responsibility to get in there and figure it out and test things and, and bring theory to, to real life. Um, and, you know, it's not easy. Um, you know, there was another question that talked about like sexual violence and what that looks like in terms of abolition and abolition is for the entire spectrum of harm. And, you know, how that's gonna look, how it's resolved, what justice looks like for a survivor of sexual violence um, is gonna vary. And it's gonna, and we ha also have to keep in mind that there's a lot of people who've who are survivors of harm that still have that uh, orientation that the only thing that would bring me justice is the carceral state. So like, how do you deal with that? You know, so I think um, it is, it's a question, it's, it's not a question that I can answer. It's a question that we collectively can work towards building an answer. That, the context for that clip was Leslie Turner from uh, Nevada Mass Lib talking about doing abolition work um, in among folks who are saying, you know, well, what about punishment? What about these perpetrators? What about this, the criminals? And and I think Francis um, Calpatur comes to us with a, a load of experience on this particular question, especially back in the 1990s when, again, crime and justice, crime and punishment was at the forefront of everyone's political talk. 
Um, Francis, can you talk a little bit about that tension and, and, and uh, maybe we can open it up after that? Larry, why are you outing me that I'm old, brother? You know, so 1990s, I was two years old. You were two, um, you know, you're a genius, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so th thanks, Larry. So I'm, I'm coming into this by both reflecting on our prior experience, but you know, the things that Leslie and our sisters from Puerto Rico say is, is definitely the thing that we encounter in organizing work on, on the everyday, right? And, and also it, it speaks to kind of the central thing of why we actually build organizations. Right? And so one thing that I want to say before I go into the experience is we build organizations really, one function of it is so that we have a different place for learning, a different place for folks to understand their material conditions, their lived experience, right? And, and as Leslie said, not only understand it, right? Um, but also to figure out what needs to, what they need to do to change those conditions. So in fact, it is a learning environment that we're creating at the best of our, of our tradition as organizing. So let, let me share an experience of, of what, what I mean. So the mid 1990s was um, really kind of a high water mark and we're still there in, in a lot of ways, a high water mark of this country's war on drugs. Um, communities of color were reeling from you know, the crack epidemic, right? That, 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 that has been happening in communities. We've had you know, really 20 plus years of, of racialization of the war on drugs where, where folks were actually you know, kind of beating us around this stuff, right? That then helped emerge this idea of the super predator, right? That, that, that became kind of the motivating thing of locking people up. And, and it, it brought up all of this tough on crime kind of legislation from the three strikes you're out to the anti-gang injunctions. And really for some of us, it culminated in this Clinton sponsored crime bill, right? In 1994 of which, by the way, kind of our current president advocated for, um, that put 100,000 more cops in the streets, right? And also did kind of this mandatory minimums for drug offenses that, you know, kind of ballooned the carceral state as we know it at this point, right? So, and, and also we were coming out of an economic recession at that time. So, so all of this tough on crime, you know, kind of um, um, uh, narrative was, was kind of hitting, hitting a chord. So when we were door knocking in neighborhoods right, and ask folks, what's the most important problem that you're facing, right? Guess what people were saying? They were saying drugs, they were saying crime, they're saying, you know, that crack house down the street, right? Um, or that crack house next door is, 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 I'm worried about that because I'm worried about the safety of my kids. And so then when you engage them, okay, what's the solution? Do you think that would happen to that? You know, 99 of 100 times people would say cops, we need more cops. Um, and, and put those, Put those young kids who are in the crack house behind bars so that they can't harm my kids. So national organizing groups at that time organized around this analysis. Some of us knew that we couldn't go there. Right? Some of us knew kind of in the organizing time we can't go there. Um, so we took kind of a different tack from organizing around more cops, organizing kind of, you know, um, shutting down crack houses in neighborhoods. Um, we can, what we did instead, because knowing that that was the ideology of the time, we convened groups from around the country and, and, and did a, we developed kind of this uh, 15 part internal education of members and leaders about what was the war on drugs, why are we at this point and by the way, I, I, I went to my archives and I still have the goddamn, you know, curriculum of this, right? Just as by, I know, Gina, I know, I know, I know. So it was 15 parts where we looked at the role of police. We looked at the crime bill, right? We looked at kind of other alternatives of actually dealing around this and, and engage, systematically engage our members and leaders of organizations and communities of color around the country. So... Um, because we knew we needed to, act, to impact 
you know, a new analysis, right? So instead of the three strikes in your app, all after going through that, we came up with this, I know another one, the home run strategy for community safety, right? So, so then it was a new kind of way of looking at crime, looking at community safety, um, where there was real oversight of the police taking out, you know, this was the beginnings of, at least for some of us, the, the divest investing, divest from the carceral state, invest in communities to actually address those things, right? We didn't have, you know, we didn't have kind of the abolition framework at that point yet, but that was the beginnings of that, right? But so we knew that we needed to impact kind of the popular analysis, the popular narrative on crime and, and build a different kind of analysis based on real experiences and a different vision of what solutions might be to that carceral, carceral straight, uh, state. So that's kind of what we did and it was tough. It was tough to do. And, and, and we were um, um, seen as too radical in the organizing community at that time because we didn't want to kind of go down the, 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 the track of actually kind of just pandering to people's, you know, kind of fright and pandering for that and, and asking for more cops. That's a lot. I mean, there's a lot in that, and that whole debate was fascinating because people said, you know, do you lead with ideology? Do you lead where people are at? And you can lead where people, you can lead from where people are at and build and get more cops on the street and declare that a victory. And maybe in an Alinsky tradition, that is a victory, right? That, that's a, a win in, in an organizing set of demands, but uh, what are you really building? The other flip side of that extreme is what if you just lead with ideology and you use that word, um, do you have then people who are like, we're not down with that program? I'm, I'm wondering what other folks think, um, Gina, Denise, and Camila, and, and Jess. I'll, I'll start really quickly. Uh, I was just thinking about some of the things that the sisters in Puerto Rico were saying that many of the conditions that people are facing, they, they, they see what's going on all around them. And in the case of the example that Francis gave, I mean, this importance, you know, I was, when I was a kid, I'm gonna date myself too, Jesus. Uh -huh. So, you know, growing up in the late seventies, um, you know, back then uh, there was a thing called take a bat, bite out of crime, the gruff, the dog. Um, I mean, what we were seeing was culture actually was taking up this narrative of, of punishment, of criminalization. Um, and our own communities were actually experiencing that. They saw money leaving schools and going toward building jails. They saw an increase of technical surveillance when 9-11 happened. Um, they saw uh, the more resources leaving local services, youth uh, programs, libraries going into funding the police. And they still could not figure out like why their lives were actually Actually, they could figure out why their lives were doing so badly, but it was really trying to have a place and a space to discuss what were the systemic conditions for that. And I think them being able to tell their own stories and contextualize it with their own lives has a way for us to talk about these issues differently. Like it's not just ideology, it's their actual lives that is happening. And unless we're building that space in our organizations to explore that and to pose difficult questions, right? I mean, I remember during that campaign, we had both Latino and black families saying like, well, we're tired of actually having being under these conditions and then trying to break apart why were these conditions existing in the first place? And, and them being able to be able to think about what the systems were that their lives were entangled with um, and what were ways to actually intervene in them. Um, but with that, you know, really folks are kind of navigating on their own. And that's what, can, what, what the, what the why culture is so important too, is because I can still remember McGruff. That means something about how hard these, um, these ideas of punishment and criminalization get like really built into our systems of thought and thinking and talk, where then it spills into how we think we want to, our services and our structures to serve us when they actually are a disservice to us. Yeah, that's a cool point. The popularization of, of McGruff and then, you know, the contrast of that is maybe a, 
a new framework becomes more popular. It becomes contested, defund or whatever, right? Becomes contested, but how do you popularize that? And that seems like an external framing, a strategy, but also internally. And I like what you said there about the families within an organization, the members in the organization are, you know, struggling with this stuff too. And so the job of the organizer I mentioned earlier is to wear all these hats. One of those hats is wearing a, a hat of political education. And so what does that look like in the organization? And I wonder if our other um, panelists have some thoughts. And by the way, I put it in the chat, uh, folks who are, who are audience members, we're not asking you to be passive. Throw chat, throw questions. If you, if you have some burning question, we'll, we will recognize you. Um, but for now, let's get back to our panelists on the question of kind of political education. And like in my classes, I'll recognize hands, but if there are no hands, I'm gonna call on somebody and everybody gets uncomfortable and then they blame me. And then I get bad teacher evaluations and then it's a big struggle and I gotta deal with all the backlash. So I'm not gonna handle that very well today. Larry, I, I, I have a reflection or a question that the panelists could maybe speak about. And I, I came here in the eighties, right? Right around where, from Ethiopia, from Africa. And um, I, I remember that in the news and in all of the shows, no one ever talked about where these drugs were coming from and mm. how they were getting into the communities. But I remember watching the news like with Peter Jennings or, or, or Barbara Walters or something like that. And I remember the CIA, the government always being involved in, in capturing drugs, loads and loads of drugs. And then a few months later, it would get into the community and then you'd have a spike of, of drugs and arrests. And so I thought maybe like, if the panel can talk about like, why we never address where these drugs were coming from. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question that Gina alluded to a little bit around like making sure that that your organization's having conversations about the world, having conversations about the politics of it. So the framing isn't so narrow. Uh, I wonder if other folks in our um, in our collective here would love to kind of chime in. I think this is part of the campaign, you know, to um, depict, you know, these communities are communities that are like, uh, I mean, I also came here with uh, like a lot of information and misinformation. And uh, when I came here, I had to unlearn a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, information, uh, you know, things that I've, I've known about. And it's even like in, in, in how we were taught the history, you know, like back home, we were, we were taught that uh, Abraham Lincoln is the uh, uh, person who freed the slaves and, uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America, you know, and <laughs> America was not discovered. America, America was there and it was inhabited by the Native Americans and the indigenous people who lived there all the time. So I think it's, it's also like we had to also receive some sort of political education and unlearn a lot of the information that we uh, through the education. And it's still happening here in America, you know, it hasn't changed. Even the school system, the education system here, you know, I've for kids who went through the public schooling and I, I read their history books and, and I see how, how things are, are, are reflected and, and taught to the kids and all the lies that are told and all, all the things that um, are not real. And I, I think from the time that Francis and, and them were doing the organizing, not much has changed in the, in the um, how do I put it, um, in the situation of like, you know, the black folks and you know the war on drugs and and the, the victimizing of of the people and all of this i don't think i, I don't I, I don't see much has changed you know and um we're still seeing these communities being dismantled being you know uh gentrified being removed from their their you know places their homes uh uh, black folks, men especially, you know, they're like the majority of the incarcerated population. So, I mean, like even this Saturday, we were celebrating Juneteenth and I was at the Lake, Lake um, Merritt uh, uh, celebration when the shooting happened and, and the killing and all of this. And I was like, you know, black people cannot even celebrate. They cannot like, you know, 
without these kind of things happening, you know, and, and people started saying, oh, you know, you know, the stereotyping, you know, this is how it is, this is how, you know, black folks are, you know, so I, I don't think this, this has changed much, you know, so a day shout out to Ethiopia. <laughs> and everybody in country and a sister. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Thank you, Julia. Um, don't forget Hoover. I just, I just, I just, you know, yeah. I just feel like this country systematically um, oppresses people and creates like a free labor, a, a free labor and free resources for the for the halves. And I just, I, I just feel like those were the strategies that were used in these communities. And then the narrative in Africa is completely like different. It's what you see on TV. And so they program us to think of people of color in this country that way. And then when we come here and we like, like Francis was saying, the black people agreed to get the drugs out. You know, they agreed for these harsh um, uh, prison sentences. They agreed to it. They agreed to it and then locked up majority of their fa own family members. And then 20 years later, you have a gap and you have a crisis. So thank you for that. So I, I will say as, a, as an educator for 30 years almost now, I'm at the university level. I'm always kind of grateful when my students come in saying that they hated their history classes. They were bored in history. They didn't get, they don't remember very much of it because then you have to do a lot less kind of unlearning, right? Um, at that level. And, and, and I'm not talking about names and dates. I'm talking about themes and concepts and, and narratives, entire narratives. But it seems to me that this question around the organizer's job is to, to also do a lot of unlearning. We've, we've heard that, but to do some new framing and framing based on circumstances. And so like, if there's a shooting at the lake on Juneteenth, um, how do you then reverse what's going to be coming down in the media narrative, which is, this is what happens when you defund the police. This is what happened, you know, like that sort of typical kind of garbage. Um, how are you ready for that kind of reframing? And if you're reframing it, as Francis put it, in an actual campaign, actually with new language, that's one thing. And you hope that catches on. Like defund, I think, has caught on. And I, I'll kind of push back a little bit. I think that some things have changed in 20 years. I think some things have changed dramatically just in the last year. And that doesn't mean policy on the ground has changed so much, but I think the narrative has shifted. And I think people have seen 20, 30 years of the war on drugs on their communities and have said like, this is not the, and more cops, more jails, maybe not the, the answer. A couple more thoughts and then I wanna move on to the next, uh, the next theme. Yeah, uh, thank y'all for bringing up the, the history part and the aspect of having to relearn, unlearn and then relearn. So I think that's actually, that was a huge learning point for me to understand that history is spoken from the side of the oppressor. There's like that theme that is often mentioned when we talk about anything that remotely has like some time behind it. But actually I wanna also bring up the fact that this doesn't have to be historical. This is happening today. When we talk about the decriminalization of drugs today, we're also talking about the expungement of records. And that's something that's often left behind of these conversations. So I'm just bringing this up because this is the topic that was brought up, the criminalization and the racialization of the crime, of the war on drugs. The war on drugs is still happening. Um, it's just taking on different, um, different lenses, different um, levels of importance. But when we talk about, for example, the movement to legalize marijuana and cannabis, um, often we just, we're talking about the state level, but we're leaving out the folks who are serving prison sentences, folks who, if today and they were, had been arrested in these states that have legalized already, wouldn't be in jail, wouldn't be serving life sentences. These are the folks that are often left behind in these conversations um, because we continue to frame something as historical in the past that is no longer impacting us today. But today and day, we're still having conversations around free labor being provided by prison labor. My county that I live in, Hall County, Georgia, recently had a discussion about the shortage of prisoners. And the fact that that's even like a concept shortage of prisoners 
is is just really I think really speaks to the degree of indoctrination that we have around this um, concept of criminalization. So thank y'all for bringing that up. And these are just things that I'm reflecting on and how this is still happening today. Yeah, and it's a great point and how deep, how deep that indoctrination has gone. I think uh, I saw Norma with a hand up earlier. Norma, um, also one of the participants, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and chime in. Let's hear what you got to say. Yes, I wanted to comment. Uh, uh, apologies that um, it's coming a bit late after what Francis shared. When I heard when folks were asked of the community, what do you need? Uh, what I'm getting as a response today after so many years, and I don't think that you're all that you're old, but after so many years of uh, being organizing, uh, organizing with community, uh, still yet we have community with these uh, same mentality that I see the big old animal that we have to work on uh, uh, fight, right? But at the same time now, the pandemic I think brought lots of uh, grief, uh, death to our community, but also it brought in an opportunity because I had my children with me and when they uh, wanted to talk about a thing, uh, you know, there was a theme around Texas. Hey, mom, they would ask. So then Mexico uh, gave uh, gave uh, Texas to the U.S. And that's where I was like, hey, where did you see this? And they would show this to me. Uh, and like the school materials, uh, he showed me the school materials um, and I would take that on. And so this pandemic give us opportunities and we have to make the most of it. And so I see everywhere, uh, you know, like McDonald's no longer has uh, their, their, their sites. It's an opportunity to uh, be able to move folks, right? To, uh, to bring consciousness because right now is the moment. I think that we are at the right moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well said. Um, I think Shanti uh, wants to say something about Oakland kids and you OUSD kids not being served in the communities. Go ahead, Shanti, and then we're going to switch to the next theme. Oh, thanks, Larry. I'm. I actually didn't ask to speak. Oh, okay. I'm, my apologies. I, I saw something in the chat, and I'm responding to that. But uh, maybe people can respond to that. That uh, the question about um, actually, I'm not sure if we if we have time now for that response. We might come back to it. Let me just let me see if we can shift gears just for a little bit, and then we'll come hey, back. Larry, to it. some of these are going to overlap. Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, yeah. Just just one before before we leave this thing. You know, I'm I'm looking at this from organizing, right? So I think organize have two simultaneous um, um, responsibilities around this. One area is kind of our own individual kind of um, development, right? Kind of political development of understanding the war on drugs, understanding kind of what's really going on in the world, right? So, so we have a responsibility individually to know what the hell's going on and, and apply kind of our lens in doing that. But that let's not, though, let's not be happy and stop there, right? Because part of the response with the organizer and really I submit kind of the most important thing is to actually figure out how does, how does our base, how do our membership, how do folks in the community actually experience these things, right? And also then how do we provide the opportunity and the development of folks to be able to kind of understand their concrete conditions in a different way, right? And, and, and that is a harder thing to do. And, but that's the work of the organizer, right? And so let's not be happy that we now know what the hell, what the, what the hell's going on around the war on drugs, but really our, 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 our job is to ensure that in fact, our communities and our base and, our, and, and the folks in our, in our neighborhoods have a different understanding or understand their conditions differently can, and can make demands of the system in order to change it. Right. That fundamentally is our 
is our responsibility. And if we're not doing that, then we're not doing our work as organizers. No, it's a great, great reminder. It's a reminder for educators too. Educators and organizers have a lot of the same job. Uh, Gamila, I saw your hand up. I just wanted to say that this is uh, what Francis said. This is a good segue to the next subject because um, uh, working with the communities that were impacted by the war on drugs, for example, is one example of an organizing effort that needs to be done. And this is what, um, this is one of the campaigns that I'm involved in right now is the Emerald New Deal. And we are working to uh, make sure that the funds that are coming from the cannabis tax get devoted or allocated to the um, people or folks who are impacted by the war on drugs rather than just go to the general funds, which eventually goes to the police, 40% of, of it goes to the police. So this is some organizing effort that we're working on that speaks to what Francis had said that we, we just don't stop at, no, uh, at the fact that we know what's going on and we understand it, but how can we change it? How can we work with these communities to change that? So this takes us to the next subject, I think. No, no, that's right. I, first of all, back to the point about how these are overlapping themes in, in a lot of ways, but also, Camila, you're doing a better job of hosting than the host. And I appreciate that because the segue is perfect. The transition is perfect. Let's get into this next video clip and this next section about centering directly impacted folks in the work. So let's look at that video real quick. It was, um, I would say, um, you know, essential for the, um, for, the, uh, for the struggle in Los Angeles. Having the um, uh, Salvadoreños and uh, Nicaraguenses uh, involved in that, uh, in that struggle was, was really key because uh, most of the leadership that I remember, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the true leadership of the workers down there were uh, either from El Salvador or um, Guatemala or other places in, uh, in Central America, Honduras, uh, but mostly Salvadorans. Um, and so uh, they, uh, we didn't have to struggle much with them. I mean, uh, they understood this, uh, the need for um, getting involved and the need to lead the fight and the need to be in front of the, uh, of the actions. And uh, they, in fact, you know, uh, we relied on um, a lot of those leaders uh, that we um, invited to come north um, to help us with contract campaigns and to explain what was going on, um, you know, in their jurisdictions. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, for the Los Angeles experience, I think that it was um, essential to, to have those, um, uh, the, the role that those um, uh, members played uh, was uh, uh, more than important. It was very, very, uh, it was key uh, for the success of that, uh, um, you know, campaign in Los Angeles. And the difference between uh organizing in the Philippines and uh, the US, I have one story to tell. Uh, the, the National Democratic Front um, had a set of rules uh, on the relationship of the sexes. Very strict actually, I think, stupid rules, but they had the rules. And one of the things that uh, the rules say is no premarital sex. Uh, during one education section, session, uh, I argued against these rules using Marx and Engels and so on. Uh, in other words, attacking it theoretically. And uh, the course instructor said, yeah, but uh, because the people that we work with are conservative, uh, they don't, they're against premarital sex. Uh, and, I, and I said, well, that may be true in the rural areas of the Philippines, but in uh, San Francisco, if you tell people that you prohibit premarital sex, you will get left out of the room. So context matters. 
Context matters, and just to establish context for those two clips, uh, that was Joel Rocamora talking about organizing in the larger kind of movement against martial law in the Philippines. And before that, you heard from Chava Bustamante, who was um, talking about Central American workers who were working as janitors in the union for the Justice for Janitors campaign in the late, late 80s, early 1990s. Um, and I think the larger theme, and this is what I want our, our, our roundtable to kind of think about right now, and I'm going to throw it to Denise in a second for her thoughts, and then we'll, we'll move it along. But um, why is it important? Why is it significant to center the participation and the leadership of folks who are directly impacted? Why do organizers care so much about developing that leadership? Um, and then on the flip side, uh, what are the challenges in making that commitment as organizers in developing people who are the most impacted folks? So Camila kind of got the ball rolling on this theme. Um, I'm going to throw it to Denise, and then other folks can can raise their hands and chime in. Hi, all again. Um, my name is Denise Rubin. I am here in Atlanta. I, um, I am formerly incarcerated. And... Um, I think with, with being formally incarcerated and, and wanting to uh, change the world, so to say, uh, or change the, uh, 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 change um, injustices that are done to uh, different uh, sex of people, uh, with formerly incarcerated folks are directly impacted folks. <clears throat> I mean, who better to do the job than someone that uh, that has experience in justice or someone who has uh, been to prison and someone who has uh, experienced um, inequality in life who's been discriminated against. So um, when you have been directly impacted, um, I think you have the upper hand at uh, making uh, making decisions and, and organizing and finding your, 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 your base, finding your power within an organization and within the community uh, for people to, uh, to lead. Um, like I said, I, I've been in, out of, in and out of jail since maybe like 1991. Um, I've, I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot in the, inside of the jails, inside of the prison. And I saw a lot of it when I was in the streets. Um, I didn't grow, I grew up, um, in a, I, mean, I, I guess I should say a middle-class neighborhood. I had everything I wanted, but it, I got out and I, I wanted to see other things. So I saw other things and I experienced other things. And it seems like it brought me to this point to where, um, where I am now to be an organizer. So I experienced all these things. So now I have the experience and the know-how of what people need and, and what I need to do to be able to get what they need. Um, so I, I don't take no for an answer, no. So that helps me to better organize and do my job as an organizer. If a door is closed, I'm, I'm gonna try to open a window. I'm gonna organize these folks to open the window. We're gonna open the window. We're gonna kick down the door. So when when, when you're when you're directly impacted, um, I think it helps you to be able to, like you said, use your power. Your, your power is your strength. Um, I, I would say in my life, um, I use my weaknesses for my strength, my my flaws for my strengths. So I just kind of flipped that around. Um, Right now we're in a, um, we're campaigning to close the jail here in Atlanta. And people that were saying yay to closing the jail are now saying no. So so no, no, when there's a no, there there there's a yes. So no, like I said, we don't take no for a, a for an answer. Um, it helps you to go inside and find your strength and, and to make and get to the goal that you're trying to get to. Um, keep saying, um, 
Well, yeah, we 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 um, being directly impacted. You 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 have all the tools and um, that you need to be able to organize and make the changes that need to be made. That need to be made for those folks. Thanks, Denise. Um, Priscilla has a, a, a good comment in the chat. The people who are directly impacted have the most insight and wisdom on how to navigate. Sometimes looking from the outside in, we can intend to help, but end up causing problems for the folks impacted. Um, so Denise's thoughts are a lot to chew on there. Let's get it to the, uh, to the round table. Anyone wanna um, offer some, some, th some thoughts and reflections on what Denise just offered? I want to lift up what you said, Denise. I'm uh, formerly incarcerated myself, and um, I've never been really excited to say that until I got with an organization that um, helped me understand, like, what just happened to me? What did I just go through? Uh, how long was this process in my life? Like from the day I was incarcerated, it took about 10 years just to get myself out of it. You know, the uh, payments, the time served, the negotiations. Um, I learned as a formerly incarcerated person who went to jail that cops are, um, they're criminals too. And that they have their own little game going on. They write fictitious statements. I learned that there's a lot of corruption. And I learned that it's not what I used to think when I was little in this country, like the cops are here to save us and to protect us and to uphold this thing. It's a lot more than that. And there's a lot of corruption. And I was able to see that. And I was also able to get support from the right people, the right lawyers to navigate this thing. And now as an organizer, when I get into the community and I hear people say, fuck the police, I understand what they're talking about. I totally get it, you know? And, 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 and organizing that, I mean, we just, you know, we've been organizing, you know, people in our community and reallocating funds from our police budget. And now I'm a communist, I'm a Marxist, I am a horrible person, according to the opposition, and you end up with these with these things on you. But what it's taught me is, is that in 2021, this thing called law enforcement, this thing called criminal justice system, it's a business. It's a business. It is no longer um, whatever. It, 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 first it was to catch the slaves, and then it became into something that we thought it could be good. And then we found out like, no, that it can't be good. It needs to be redone, it needs to be just dismantled and then re up you know, maybe a holistic approach, maybe real rehabilitation for people. Because what I, what happened to me when I went to jail is I became depressed. I, my personality changed. I couldn't get a job because every time you put my name in a background check, everything pops up. And so it, it, it you know, you, you're, you're trapped in a cage as an incarcerated person. And so once I learned how to organize with people and change policy and change the narrative. I found out that it's my story, the power of the story, like your story is what changes these things. And I became less ashamed to do it. And just last weekend, you know, I went head to head with our mayor in our city. And, you know, I was called all kinds of names and everything, but at the same time, it felt good to stand up for people that were like me in jail, that are still in jail, that are not going to get out. They're not going to get out. This is it for them. And then if they do get out, there's mental issues, man. Like when you're locked up, there's issues that happens to you mentally. And we got We have to take care of our people. We can't just like throw them away. And so I just appreciate what you said, Denise. And, you know, that's what I, I, I that's what I bring you know, as a formerly incarcerated person is I try to tell my story, like when they look at me, some people will say, well, you don't look like you've been to jail. Exactly, exactly. We have to change what that is. What, who's, what, what, you know, what's the proper way of looking for somebody who go to jail, black? You know, like, what are they trying to say? So we have to change all these things at the same time. And um, being impacted is definitely I used to be scared of it, but now I use it as fuel. So that's what I have.
Thank you, Ade. Uh, Denise and Ade with powerful statements. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Gamila, and then maybe we can get a couple more thoughts, and we'll move on. Um, thank you, Ade. Your uh, your contribution was really powerful. Um, I, I think that brings us to the issue of like maybe um, healing centered organizing, um, because you know what Ade has said um, that you know the trauma, the you know like the mental issue that comes from going through the experience, whether it's incarceration, whether, you know, whatever kind of like impact, uh, negative impact that the people have suffered, uh, because, you know, this will help, you know, definitely um, not only heal, but also build communities with like, um, like with individual and collective health that, that can, uh, because well-being also promotes, you know, change, and and when you we combine, we combine the the emotion and, and the uh, healing with the organizing effort. I think that's um, that's can be very powerful, and we can we can really reach a point where we can get to the and 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 this can be through like storytelling, you know. Through different kind of uh, practices that we can we can we can have, but again, this can also bring us back to the subject of are we organizing or are we doing mutual aid, <laughs> uh, like in in form of like mental health support and uh, and and these kind of things. So, but I think um, uh, we can try to figure out some like uh, practices or, or strategies for um, healing, and while focusing on our organizing strategies. Uh, that will change, you know, whatever public policies or, or, or things that we are we are trying to um, achieve. Thank you, Gamila. And and again, you you're anticipating our next conversation, but that's going to be a smooth transition into into that theme. But I want to recognize uh, Carlos, one of our audience members, who has a uh, a question. And I'm sorry, by the way, folks, if you're raising your hand and I'm not check, I, it's hard for me. I'm not seeing the the, the icons go up, so. Um, apologies if, if I've missed you, but go ahead, Carlos. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Please. thank you. Uh, well, really quickly, I wanted to relate a bit the involvement and, and in organizing uh, during critical times. Uh, I wanted to share a bit about our campaign um, of uh, that I think represents this points. And when in 2016, where the rates, uh, uh, the most more aggressive rates by ICE on, on our neighborhoods, uh, terrorizing families. And it was this moment where we came out and talked to folks uh, in a way that uh, we needed to organize at a neighborhood level, right? Started involving folks that were directly impacted and saying, you know, in reality, no one's going to save us. The only way of uh, doing so is knowing your rights, defend, how to defend your family, uh, your neighborhood. And so it was basically that, right? To talk about constitutional rights that we have as people and give them, um, uh, give them that, right? And, and also inviting them to create a um, uh, uh, a watch uh, team uh, where neighborhood watch that were, uh, you know, watching out for for um, for raids or for uh, activity. And this started creating impact, right? Um, not only do we want to stop deportations and stay hidden in our homes, right? We want to organize and 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 live and and, and at, at a national level, with uh, with Trump and the in, in power, we didn't have um, a national um, uh, well-being, but it, things started at home, right? Like uh, at home with your with your family and your neighborhood and the and the local sheriff, right? Um, so here we say uh, the cops and 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 ICE are the same shit. Um, the same pigs, really, uh, because uh, you know when you f these festivals that they try to like 
get closer to our community, they're not getting us closer. They're just making us uh, make a work action where you don't, you're not gonna start a process of destroying my family, terrorize my, my neighborhood when all you're doing is criminalizing and deporting us. Um, and so at this same time, uh, it, it's not like we're not only watching your home, but come out, we're gonna keep widening this. Uh, uh, and so this interaction with uh, Sheriff Department gave us uh, good results. Uh, as a reference, um, we have an agreement with uh, certain counties, uh, uh, with uh, sh local sheriffs, at certain counties, and we would tell folks that this is uh, this happened thanks to uh, their cooperation, their participation. Uh, folks are feeling empowered and grateful and uh, more willing to participate and want to um, organize next uh, the next county over, uh, we're, uh, the next city over. Uh, we're gonna uh, start. Or we're gonna go get the the whole county, right? And really it's not having all of the uh, of the of the government of the department but just a small part that well, where folks that live there and so this is one of the biggest uh, uh and successful campaigns that yielded results uh, uh that told folks that through organizing you can make life better right we're, we're here this is where we live this is where we shop this is where we go to church this is where we go to school and this that you're doing five uh or ten folks really created an impact at at, at the whole city level the 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 lens the police has upon our uh, uh, as to how to see it, how they see us is different, right? It's a community that you need to treat with respect, with care, because it's organized and it's demanding that, right? And so, as we say, all of these things are all related directly, but I wanted to share this. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And Carlos is uh, one of our med mentors with spade work. I'm going to throw it over to Francis, who also has his hand up. Yeah. Oops, let me take that stuff down. So I just want to provide a reflection. Someone who's been in organizing for almost 38 years, that's a long time. Um, and why this issue, in fact, or this theme is just a historical context in organizing. There was a time when organizing actually said, you can't have people, you can't have organizers coming from the communities themselves, right? Because their role is to build an organization and, and, and that their role are architects, right? That they're technicians on bringing folks together and building power for that, for that community. It wasn't that long ago. And in fact, some organizing outfits still hold that view. Luckily, not as many but still some hold that view, right? Um, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's a real important context to know that the folks in this room are in fact changing that equation for organizing, for the organizing community uh, in this country, right? So that's kind of the first thing. But also I think for a person who's coming from that, it also raises a couple of strategic challenges, right? for someone who actually kind of runs organizations, organizing organizations. There are two key things that I think um, um, raises challenges. One is resources, right? That in fact, it uh, because folks are coming from communities and have just materially kind of more needs, whether it's childcare or whether it's their transition or whether kind of a bunch of stuff that the organization in fact has to provide a support infrastructure for folks who are working in those organizations to be able to succeed, to be able to actually do the work. So it actually demands a lot more resources and infrastructure that traditional organizations didn't have to worry about, right? right. So that's, I think is kind of the, uh, the, the first one. And then the other, and, and then because of that, is that it also then um, subjects 
this this uh, the 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 criteria for success of organizing, right? That we actually have to be much more both nimble and much more grounded around kind of what our organizing goals are. What what how does that actually happen um, with folks? So so those are a couple of things, kind of just in my reflection and experience of seeing that transition happening in the organizing community. Um, are the implications when you have to actually center directly impacted folks on all levels of the organization, not just members, leaders, but staff and other decision making um, uh, levels in an organization. That's, that's really helpful. Um, because, you know, like you, you mentioned, the old line or old guard organizing, it still happens, of course, is that the, the emphasis is on these professional college educated organizers who can like take a an organizer salary which in many cases is not so great because they've already got some support they grew up middle class upper middle class or even you know wealthy in some cases they can sort of absorb that and then the commitment of the organization then should be if you're really serious about centering directly impacted leadership you've got to not just say that you've got to actually do that and then the impact that that can make in the organizing work and i and i think you know what Denise and the day and, and Carlos have 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 expressed is is but the potential is like limitless, right? I mean the impact that that has then on the community and to really build um, folks who can trust. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more thought. I don't know if there was another hand, but Gina and Jazz and Camila, I think I see Camila's hand. Go ahead, Camila. If nobody else is is uh, needs to, because I want to give opportunity to somebody who has not had a chance to talk. <laughs> But um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, you know, just uh, what Francis said is like, you know, um, we need to focus on, on, on organizing and organizing within these communities uh, or directly impacted folks while it's challenging, while it's hard, because these communities are struggling with the trauma, there is a mistrust, there is like the lack of resources, like Francis said, there's so many uh, things that are uh, challenging the, um, the organizing idea or, 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 or but it's very important. We have a saying in, in, in our culture that says, which means fire burns the person stepping on it or standing on it. So these are the people who are burned by the fire. So, you know, the, there has to be like a distinct, uh, distinct way of culturally and contextually, uh, um, you know, resonant practices to um, develop, you know, leadership and organizing and uh, within these communities uh, within a very, within a safe and supportive uh, environment. And I think it's, while it's challenging, while it's hard, it's worthwhile and it's what's need to be done. Yeah, worthwhile needs to be done. Good cap on that discussion. I'm going to ask Matt if you could play the next video because we're going to transition to the which all related area around making sure um, we promote self-care in organizing. Um, let's hear that next video. Two things that I learned, um, you know, over my 40 years of being in this activity. One is that uh, um, in the beginning, I thought that I was doing this for people. But that's bullshit, you know. I, I did it all the time because of me, because, you know, um, uh, as my community and the, uh, uh, the group in society that I identify with goes up, I go up with them. The second one is that uh, organizing, you know, uh, if you're really serious, if you're really committed to, to be an organizer, organizing is a lifetime uh, activity. Uh, that's the only way. When you integrate, um, you know, um, uh, organizing into your daily life, then you don't get burned out, right? Then you find ways to, uh, you know, deal with uh, situations that you have. If you're married, you know, my wife was also an organizer. Uh, she worked for CIU and, you know, we met. Um, she was a volunteer um, organizer for the United Farm Workers. I was working in the fields, that's how we met, right? Uh, and then, you know, she, when we moved to San Jose, she uh, went to work for SEIU, and then I went to work for SEIU. And, uh, you know, we have two kids together. And so, you know, we had to deal with that reality of our lives, right? And so we had to integrate those realities into our daily life 
uh, and make sure that we cover for, you know, uh, for each other when uh, she had a late night meeting or I had a, you know, a weekend, um, uh, you know, activity or, or things like that. So um, organizing is not something that you do and then you go home and, um, you know, I come back to, to it the, the next day. Organizing is the, the, something that, you know, um, it's with you <laughs> 24 hours, you know, seven days a week. And uh, when you, you know, accept that that's, you know, uh, really what you want to do, then, you know, uh, you start seeing things with a different um, perspective. So uh, my um, advice, uh, if you call it that, for young uh, organizers is that if you are really um, committed to organizing, that if you're really committed to making changes to your life and to the uh, communities that you live in, then you need to, you know, be serious and, um, and accept that this is something that, uh, you know, um, at least for the next five or 10 years of your life, this is what's, you know, what you're going to do. And um, this part of your life is not separate. I think that in, in many ways, people are beginning to understand some basic indigenous concepts. Indigeneity is an idea that can guide you in life. That's not about being Indian, but it's about values. So for example, relationality. Tribes, commonly, intertribal, and globally, believe that we are all in relationship to one another. We are in relationship to the natural world. Look at the example of COVID. Masses of people, millions, have begun to realize that their health is as important as the health of a healthcare worker or a transit, transit worker or a supermarket worker, that we are all in relationship and that what we do has an impact on one another. Right, so you heard there from a couple of our former guests who combined have you know decades and decades of organizing experience are well positioned to answer that question around burnout. And that's the context under which this kind of theme can, comes up. And it comes up every week. And frankly, in my classes I teach at, at San Francisco State University on organizing, it comes up to every single guest speaker. It's always kind of funny when I have a, a an organizer who comes in as a guest speaker, and maybe that organizer has been in the work for a year or two, and and they will even get the question from my students: How do you prevent burnout? And the organizer with such little experience is still talking about, yeah, I, you know, you've got to make sure you take care of each other and take care of yourself. But the uh, the answers tend to vary, and so I'm I'm curious, and Gamila can get us started. And you brought it up, right? Um, we can have this conversation about like best practices, but also just sort of like why, why it's even important. Because there was a time, and not to just kind of pick on the old guard Alinsky folks, but there was a time when people said, self-care, what are you talking about self-care? This, this is organizing. This is for real tough people. We're not worried about like taking care of ourselves and each other. Um, so let's open this conversation up. And Gamila, your thoughts, your reflections. Thank you. Well, this is, this is a, a very big topic, but uh, <clears throat> I, I think um, I'm going to start it by... Um, what uh, Audre Lorde said in, in her uh, 1988 uh, book of A Burst of a Light, that caring for myself is not a self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. That is an act of political wa warfare. I mean, this has become kind of like the manifesto of like, you know, <laughs> organizing self-care uh, perspective. Uh, for me, I wanted to kind of like make it a little bit personal because this is self-care is personal. And um, I see in the instruction, they said also like, you know, if you can talk about an experience or, or, or like nowadays I'm dealing with, um, you know, the sickness of my husband, he was diagnosed with lymphoma. And um, this came like right in the middle of so many things that are happening in my life, you know, starting a new job, uh, working on organizing, uh, taking more responsibilities, you know, being involved with stuff back home, you know, many, many, many things. But for me, like self-care has really 
evolved and, and, and there was also a process of learning and unlearning things um, uh, in this process. From the time that I was, you know, a student activist back home in Sudan, when like, you know, if you complain about, you know, having too many things or stress and all this, you're seen or uh, perceived as a weak person, especially as a, a woman, you know, like you can't take this, you can't do that, you, you know what I mean? So um, it was very important for me to kind of like um, learn how to take care of myself and respond to any um, like uh, gestures or offer for help. When I went through this experience and I'm still going through it of, you know, having to care for my husband and, and you know, the family while, while doing my organizing work, I, 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 I resonate, uh, what, what Chavez said resonates with me is like organizing is, is uh, a day-to-day -day thing. It's part of your life. If you integrate it in your, in your life, then you don't, you don't struggle with, with, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's a process that you have to go through to get to that point where you are taking care of yourself and at the same time taking care of your business. If, if I was saying, if that's um, the right way to say it. And also like dealing with the issue of um, as a black woman, you know, seeing my vulnerability as weakness also is an issue, you know, or that's, that was something that I, I, I suffered or I struggled with. And I, I, I had to, um, you know, have so many discussions, so many, you know, like ways of trying to change that narrative with, even within myself. Um, so um, there are different stigmas, you know, and impacts on, of um, how people do or don't speak about like, you know, mental health or need for, for self-care, you know, and like the, especially like the strong black woman trope and viewing vulnerability as a weakness in general, that's an issue that's really um, important to talk about. And because it also limits the people ability to speak out about their struggles and, and, and instead it can kind of like create a feeling of um, denial, shame, guilt, anxiety. And like when, when like faced with this um, issues of like mental health struggle or um, um, issues of self-care. Um, I, I, I just learned that uh, I have to, you know, prioritize myself and my health because if I don't do that, you know, it's gonna impact my work, it's gonna impact everything. And also I had to learn to accept and receive any offer of help, even if like, you know, um, an offer for a cup of coffee, you know, while I'm just talking or venting or, or like, you know, a phone call or like, you know, a meal delivery or whatever, you know, I, 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 uh, and, and also like, you know, choosing what environment that you, you, you work in um, is very important. You know, if we go back to the organizing uh, sessions, I wish the, the, the culture of the organization is very important because it helps you kind of like, you know, um, it supports you. So uh, finding a supportive environment help you kind of like deal with these kind of issues. And uh, while dealing with my experience, I got all the support that I needed. I, you know, I didn't have to uh, like labor on thinking of, you know, how is this gonna happen? You know, it's like, everything was like kind of went smooth. Took my meetings from next to my, my husband's hus hospital bed, you know, it's, it just like, it worked, it worked because, you know, you, you have a supportive environment that, that foster, that, that helps, you know, like with, with uh, uh, prioritizing your self-care over like anything else, because that's very important. Uh, I also received, you know, calls from teammates, you know, um, it, it kind of like say yes, say yes to anything that can uh, help you um uh feel better or get better you know don't close into yourself don't feel guilty that you know don't feel ashamed don't feel unable i think these are all important things that we have to um to look into when we are talking about the self-care issue within organizing um i, I know like you know self-care uh, has has become like a notion uh, uh, like a, a a craze right now there's it's, it has become an industry 
you know, like a billion dollar industry and people have also capitalized on it. Like they've capitalized on everything else in this country, you know, like they capitalize on the prisons, they capitalize on the drugs, you know, everything, you know? So um, I think we have to like stay focused on the meaningful, you know, kind of self-care that we need uh, within the organizing, um, you know, uh, work that we are doing. So that's what I can say now. And I, can, um, I, I, I think what we can do is maybe like, I can ask a few questions that will kind of like help um, uh, kind of steer, the, steer the discussion a little bit. And I, I'm, I'm thinking what, what maybe my first question would be like, what would people think of what Audrey Lord had said about you know, um, the need for self-preservation and self-care self in, in the organizing work? And also, um, um, oh gosh, I forgot the name. <laughs> uh, Angela Davis, what she said about the radical self-care notion, you know, and that she started to practice self-care while she was in, uh, in prison. Um, uh, and the, the Black Panther, you know, um, self-care self and community care effort also. And they've actually come up with this thing first before even science had proved that self-care is very important, you know, for, and it, it also, like, you know, um, trauma affects the mental health, like high blood pressure, like uh, breast cancer for women, they, they can all, you know, be related to uh, trauma and stress and, and burnout and all of that. So, I mean, these are like some, some, some things that I'm throwing in and I hope people can also discuss more. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. You've given us so much to think about right now, so much to talk about. Um, first, you know, my best to your your husband, your family, and to you. And I, I love the fact that you you said, you know, like taking care of yourself is taking care of your business. And and we often think about self care and it, like you talk about it as a fad and the you know sort of the, the the money that comes along with it now and all the opportunities people are. And self care all is kind of framed as very individualistic, but. I love that you talk about being open to accepting from others. And that's really what being in community is too. So self-care seems like counter, but it, it actually isn't. Um, I wanna open this up to some comments and questions. I'm gonna go first to uh, to Donna who had a, uh, a thought. Go ahead, Donna, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, one of the main things that comes to me with the topic of self-care is for organizers is what are we organizing for anyway? Isn't it always, isn't the goal always to improve life for everyone? That, that's the goal. And as organizers, we already know, when, when are these improvements gonna come? Are they coming tomorrow, next week, next year, in the next decade? Like it's not coming right now, even though we're working towards that. So we have to have, I mean, balance. Organizing is a, it's a way of life. It's a way of life, but it's uh, only a part of our lives. And anytime any one thing consumes our lives, we're out of, we're out of balance. And we're also giving more energy, credence and approval to the systems that we're fighting in the first place. Like this is a setup that we even have to um, talk about self-care or not, or not getting into burnout because they designed it so that we have to spin our wheels or feel like we have to all the time. And I'm like, damn it, no, I'm, I'm not gonna get caught in that. I deserve to live right here, right now, today, and not just self-care as um, I got to take care of myself so I'll be able to spin my wheels. No, I take care of myself because like that's what living actually is. And not only do I deserve to, you know, heal my broken places, damn it, I deserve to thrive and enjoy my life to the fullest right now today while I'm organizing. So, you know, I'm gonna put in my work to organize and then I'm gonna go do something I love. I love going to the beach. 
Um, I love to sew. I, I love to dance. All of these different things, like who am I even without organizing? Who am I without punching a clock at work? Who am I without being someone's mother? I'm just, I'm me. And so if we are organizing to make life better and we know that that's something that's coming in the future, like, are you holding your breath? Are you waiting to live and thrive until then? If, if that's what you're doing, I'm telling you that you're, we are, you've already accepted the program and that you don't deserve every good thing in life right now today, which is actually all you have. You don't have tomorrow. You don't have next week. You damn sure don't have a decade from now. And it's radical. Like it's, we've, we've been raised in these systems to spin our wheels, to grind. And so naturally that's, that's part of you know, our hustle in organizing. Also, everything we organize for, there's a sense of urgency. And that's true. And that's not gonna go away until we win. You still only have today. And the people that you organize for, that you organize with, they have today. And I'm gonna tell you this, like I've purposed to live this way anyway. And I was coming back from a funeral, coming back home to get on the phone and make some phone calls in the community that I was organizing with, working with Francis in 2018. And I was rear-ended on the freeway, sustained a concussion. And I have been disabled and housebound ever since. I cannot go to the beach. I can't go outside in the sunlight. Um, uh, after this two hour class, I will, I'm, I'm gonna crash and burn because I have about two hours of energy every day. That's it. And so I, I, I love to be with you all, but like the rest of my week, I'm gonna be trash. This is what I choose to invest my energy in because it's so important. If I can't say anything else to you all, you deserve to live and thrive right now today. Organizing is a part of your life. It is a way of life. But you are a living being even without organizing. And, and it's a radical thing that you need to do for yourself. And you will pour that energy into the communities and people that you organize with because they deserve to live and thrive today in every way that they can. So who are you? What are you alive for? What are you organizing for? What do you hope this world to look like? Pour some of that into you right now, today, because this is it's actually what you have. And that's radical. And it's like, you know, go somewhere to this damn system. Yeah, I'm broke down, I'm tired, I don't have everything I need, but I still am gonna put on, on some music and I'm gonna do the cha-cha slide or whatever I can to lift my spirits and say, damn it, I'm alive and this is my capacity and I'm gonna do it. That's, I just wanna say that to y'all. You deserve to live and thrive right now, today. Thank you, Donna, for sharing that and for sharing yourself as well. Um, just to kind of parrot the chat a little bit. Um, I think we have maybe a couple of on this topic, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Maybe another couple of minutes. Comentarios, in our, uh, in este tema. And I'm hearing feedback. So. Why are we doing you the fun? translation here yeah we're, we're getting some English feedback English. um oh. I, I think that's one of the issues yeah i think um, we're good okay so uh maybe uh you know gina jazz denise anyone else want to sort of wrap up some some thoughts and then i we, we really do have to transition out um but there's so much to chew on from what we've heard so far so i'll, I'll be quiet and allow you all to chime in here yeah well 
I wanted to share with you guys what I learned in my org, which is in regards to self-care. Um, a lot of times what we, what I do in my job, because my job is engagement, is I bring home the pain with me. I bring home the pain of the folks that I've been talking to throughout the day or throughout the week. And if I don't like get it out of my subconscious and center back to who I am, it is absolutely debilitating. I can't work because I'm pissed off that somebody in this community is suffering about this and that. So I really do think that self-care um, is really important and you have to have a discipline yourself. What I do is I, and this is what I've been taught, I've never done this before, but every morning I get up and I look at myself in the mirror and I talk to myself. And I remind myself, like, today is a different day. There's going to be another fight. I'm going to be upset about it. I'm probably going to be uh, stressed out about it all day. But as I practice this, I was able to get this technique now where I can, like, park it. I can park it. It doesn't affect the way that I work. It doesn't affect the way that um, I'm thinking. And it, it helps process and it helps you show up to work in a holistic way, in a whole manner. If you don't do those kind of self-care, like getting enough sleep, eating the right food, um, really learning the politics of your own area, like what's going on, then it's really hard to take care of yourself. And so I, I just wanted to share that with you all. Like it all starts, like I know for me, it's that morning talk. I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, <laughs> what, what, what's the message? What's happening? How are we going to deal with today? Um, and being in an organization that deals with, you know, formerly incarcerated issues, it's really stressful. And so I always make it a fact to do that so that when I, when I turn up with my teammates, when I show up at work with the rest of the team, that I am solid for them and so that we can move together. So I think it starts, it's not something you go out and you get. I think it's something that you have to do. Like you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta check your own self and do it for yourself. I don't think anybody can make you do it. And so that's what I learned. I, I appreciate all these, these thoughts. And there's so much good stuff in the, in the chat too. If people haven't been paying attention to the chat, make sure you're looking at those great resources as well. I've got to practice a little self-care now because I'm stressed out that we're up against the clock. So I've got to transition out apologize to everyone who's still got something burning to say i knew this was going to happen right we're just scratching the surface on a lot of this stuff we went deeper today but we are still scratching the surface which means that the reflection piece is super super important and remains important and valuable um, but i want to transition to uh previewing our next and final week week 10 of the freedom school and i'm really excited about this um i'll just say sort of on a personal note my favorite book on the civil rights movement by far is a book called I've Got the Light of Freedom. And it's written by a professor named Charles Payne who wrote it about the organizing tradition. Too many books about the civil rights movement are about the oratory tradition and the big moments and the big marches. Charles Payne writes about organizing in Mississippi and writes about it as intimately as you can write about it. He interviews everybody. And most of the folks in the book are not people who anyone has really heard of before if they've just focused on a popular understanding of the movement. Next week, we've got Charles Payne joining us along with one of the organizers in Mississippi during Freedom Summer of 1964, Zahara Simmons. And so Dr. Zahara Simmons, who was a longtime professor at University of Florida after her career as an organizer and Charles Payne, who's written about organizing and the movement as well as if not better than anybody else are going to join us for this really important conversation about Freedom Summer 1964, that campaign, but broadly speaking about SNCC and its work to kind of bring organizing into the movement. The idea of spade work comes from Ella Baker, right? Not just the idea, but the, the language of spade work comes from Ella Baker, legendary uh, organizer and mentor to a whole generation of young activists in the early 1960s who then became organizers. And her admonition to them was to go into communities and organize and build and build relationships. And it's not about hitting and then doing a quick rally and then leaving. It's about building and nurturing something strong. We're gonna hear that story next week. So I cannot uh, tell you how much more. I mean, I'm so excited about it. I'm hoping you all can share this information with your networks. We're gonna be pushing it out to a great degree. Um, it is our last session after all. And so we're going to try to be um, really, really uh, 
tight with it, but that's going to be next Monday, June 28th from 10 to 12. Um, we've got too many people to thank today. I, I just want to say thank you to all of our participants, both in the chat and in the round table. It was a, an incredible conversation. Of course, always to our uh, interpretation team of Ale and Naira and Matt for doing incredible work on the tech side. Um, we have that last episode. We'll see you next Monday, 10 a.m. on the West Coast, other times everywhere else. You all, please keep staying safe and healthy, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.